today, uh, I'm not going to be talking too much about properties. Instead, I'm going to be addressing uh, a topic which has been close to my mind in the past couple of years, One Belt, One Road. And I'm sure a lot of you are wondering why a property developer will be thinking about One Belt, One Road, and what is One Belt, One Road? I have to admit, when I first heard of the grand plan in uh, 2013, when President Xi Jinping introduced this grand scheme, I heard, oh, it's going to be 65 countries, 4.4 billion people. I said, my God, you know, how are you going to be able to make that materialize, make that happen? But um, after following it for the last couple of years, I'm convinced that this is actually going to be materializing in a very rapid manner. And what I want to uh, share with you today is uh, my thoughts on the prospects uh, of the One Bad One Row and then actually how it can happen. And let me first of all show you a map of the uh, One Bad One Road. Uh, this is not an official map uh, issued by um, Beijing. This is actually a map that's been uh, constructed by a think tank in Hong Kong headed by the first chief executive, Mr. C.H. Tong. There is no official map of the One Belt, One Road uh, from China. And even the list of the 65 countries wasn't uh, really uh, announced formally. So in this map, you can see that, um, if you can see clearly, the yellow uh, line is the China-Mongolia-Russia economic corridor. The new Asia, Eurasia land bridge is the uh, line in the uh, middle there. And um, following that is the China Central Asia, West Asia Economic Corridor, uh, coming down here. And then the China Pakistan Economic Corridor. And the Bangladesh, China, uh, India, and Myanmar Economic Corridor. And then, of course, there's the dark line that's uh, the common route shared by all these uh, different routes. And that's the Silk Road Economic Belt. The 21st century um, maritime silk road is the, the line that's underneath. So it's covering a huge area. And the list of the 65 countries are here um, for any of you who might be interested. Um, but how actually are we going to be looking at this kind of scheme? you probably have been following. The AIIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, has been formed with 57 founding members. And I hear by the end of this year, there will be likely 100 members. So a great big chunk of the world's um, countries are getting themselves involved into this whole exercise. And on this um, uh, AIIB, 15 European countries are founding members already. So what does that say? That's telling us there's a lot of interest in the Belt and Road. And the Asian Infrastructure Bank uh, is now capitalized at 100 billion US. But when I heard that figure, I was a little bit disappointed because I read from IMF reports in Asia alone, every year we require 800 billion US for infrastructure. But the AIB is just the starting point. And then, of course, there's a Silk Road Fund, 40 billion US for investment, uh, initiated by China. But that's hardly enough. So this Belt and Road, in order for it to, to be successful, it's got to be a world project. We all have to be involved. It cannot be just championed by China. Of course, we can all understand um, China is introducing this grand scheme, this idea, uh, because it will facilitate China's uh, overcapacity to be exported to these countries. Um, 
a lot of Chinese companies would like to go and invest overseas. And of course, the um, relationship with all these uh, countries will be improved if the infrastructure is there. So all these, of course, will, will be good for China, but it's a win-win situation. It's not China going out to just take advantage of everybody. If China can help these countries develop better, I believe the whole world will be a better place. We'll be living in a safer place. Because this 65 countries, 4.4 billion people, 63% of the world's population, but it's only 30% of the world's GDP. So there's a lot of upside there. Then again, um, okay, all these figures are so huge and grand. How do we make it work? And I have to uh, confess, um, and at the same time, um, do a bit of free publicity for Hong Kong. Um, I was appointed to be um, the chairman of the Hong Kong Trade Development Council uh, last year. Um, I have a very close relationship with our chief executive, so I guess he understands my thinking and feeling about um, the economic uh, situation in Hong Kong. Uh, so I was thinking, if we can help build a platform, a global platform, to facilitate the growth and development of the Belt and Road. That would make it so much easier for everybody because I was also thinking uh, two years ago, if my company wants to be involved into this whole exercise, how actually am I going to get it started? It's impossible. My, my company is not too small, but it's not too big either. And I think even for the global companies, they will find it hard to try and uh, really get their uh, hands around these uh, countries. So what are we doing in Hong Kong? I believe Hong Kong can be the investment and financing center, professional service backup, and also maybe uh, operation uh, backup center for the Belt and Road projects. And of course, to get the ball started, it must be infrastructure investment. And China, I think, is already starting uh, to do that. But that's not going to be sufficient. So what we are doing in Hong Kong is that we have established, first of all, a website totally dedicated to the Belt and Road. And uh, it's there for you to see. And what we are trying to do now is to find as much information as possible on the Belt and Road and the possible projects and the people who might be interested to be involved. So we're building that platform. And I'm glad to say since the establishment of this uh, portal last year, uh, over half a million uh, people have already visited and there's a lot of repeat visits. And we're getting a lot of interest, a lot of inquiries. And we are now starting to build the service providers from Hong Kong and all, all over, whoever would be interested, whoever would have that experience and knowledge on how to, for example, to start infrastructure projects. How do you package it? And we know that in these countries, a lot of them are not so advanced. They are actually quite backward. So how are we going to get our money back? So I'm looking at the Chinese cities, Chinese um, development over the past 30 odd years. How have all those been um, evolved and make it happen? Right? Even for myself, investing into Shanghai 30 years ago, uh, I was only doing uh, quite um, mediocre uh, residential projects. But now I have four big projects here in Shanghai with a total buildable area of about 4 million square meters. That's how Shanghai has evolved and changed over that 30 years. And I see similarities in the Belt and Road countries. They're very backward now, but with the opening up, with the connections of infrastructure, everything else will follow. 
trade and investment will follow. Of course, to get that started, um, we, we have to point some money. So what I'm also working on right now is talking to banks. We've talked to HSBC, Standard Chartered, and banks who are interested. The Association of Banks in Hong Kong are keen to get themselves involved because they see that if this platform is built up, then Hong Kong will naturally become the financing center. So I've asked HSBC and other banks to come up with a standard loan documentation. And we want to bring that to all these countries. We know it's going to be difficult because every country will have their own way of doing business, their own legal system, their own uh, traditions and practice. But we're going to be going there to tell them, OK, this is the standard loan documentation. Can you accept this? If you can't, we will have to move next door. And I believe the 65 countries will be competing for all these foreign investment, just like the cities in China over the past 30 years. And I believe that will encourage these countries to be more open-minded. And then I'm now, the next thing, working on investment um, contracts. They will not be a standard contract that will apply to all cases, but at least it's a reference. Again, these countries, they might not be able to pay for the infrastructure. So how do you package that to make it bankable, to make it worthwhile for people to come and invest? So we're doing all that and making good headway. And hopefully in the not too distant future, we will be able to come up with um, possible um, investment opportunities for all to consider. We will use that same website and publish all the information there. And hopefully that will be um, the website that everybody will go to and understand and have a, their finger on the pulse of what's happening with the Belt and Road countries. And I totally recognize that it's impossible to try and get all countries to, um, to, to be working together in the immediate future. So we will have to identify the suitable countries to put in the first investment. And I'm sure when that gets started, everybody will be competing. And that will make all these countries a lot more attractive for investment. Um, I guess I'll just stop there. I don't want to bore you too much. And if you're interested, please go onto our website and find out all the uh, things that we're doing. And I believe you will find interest because even for China, uh, the opening up of China reform only started in 78, 79, but the first um, outside investment from Hong Kong happened in 1980. And then um, Hong Kong companies, uh, manufacturers all moved their uh, facilities to the Pearl River Delta. So all these could happen in these uh, countries, but it's got to be a world project. It cannot be just a China project. Thank you very much.